Good morning, everyone. So my name is Laura, and uh, when I was 14 years old, I decided I wanted to sail around the world on my own. So today I want to tell you a little bit about this journey, why I wanted to make it, uh, what I learned from it. Uh, so I'm just going to start with a short video so you get an idea of what it even looked like out there. So enjoy that. Naar de SSB met, en later ook met andere zeilers. Gewoon alle vliegende vissen weer van dek af, met kleine inktvisjes. So obviously, I didn't just... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I didn't just wake up one day and decide that it, this is what I wanted to do. I, um, I grew up quite unusually. So my parents sailed around the world for about seven years. They started off in Holland, 
sailed to New Zealand, which is where I was born. So I actually grew up with them on the boat, sailing around the world. And um, I was about five years old when we came back to Holland, which is where my dad is originally from. Uh, my mom wasn't a big sailor, actually. She, she kind of didn't, well, she kind of hated the sailing, really. So she said, you know, if we're continuing the sailing thing, I want a bigger boat that's more comfortable. And by that time, my younger sister, Kim, was also born. So we were two little girls on this boat, and my mom said, I don't want to do this anymore in this boat. So my dad started building another boat. This was like the seventh boat that he had built for himself. And it was the biggest by, by far. It was to be about 22 meters long. And uh, he started building it from scratch. Sadly, about a year later, I was six years old, and the boat was just a little bit further than on this picture, my parents decided to separate. So they got a divorce and they gave me the choice who I wanted to live with. And I had always been drawn to the water and to the boats. I loved being with my dad building this boat and watching him. So I chose to live with my dad. And my younger sister automatically went through my mom. And we kind of never really saw each other much anymore, although we did both live in the Netherlands. Now, by now, the boat is almost finished. <laughs> my dad did continue building this boat, so while I grew up, and yes, it did take him a little while. Um, anyhow, you can imagine that while growing up on this boat and seeing my dad build it, I got quite inspired to build my own boat, uh, which looked like this. I was very proud of it. <laughs> and um, it really kind of is where all of my adventures started. I built this, and I sailed it across the river where we lived, which was a ah, reasonably big river. Um, and I was so nervous and I was so excited and I got to the other side and there was like a little beach and a tree. Um, and it really felt like I had made a world voyage of sorts. Um, of course, as I grew up and I got bigger, I got bigger boats. I started doing a lot of competition sailing in Holland. I uh, did very well in that. But this feeling I had when I sailed this tiny little raft across the river and got to this beach, that I had somehow like completed a big adventure. That feeling never left me and I wanted that again. And so the adventures always got bigger, but the feeling that I had that day actually always stayed the same of like achieving something that you wanted to do. Now, by the time I was 10 years old, I had found an old abandoned boat standing on the shipyard where we were living. And I had found the owner and asked him if I could take the boat, fix it up, clean it up, put it in the water, and then if in return, if I could actually sail it. Um, and to my big surprise, and also that of my dad, actually, the guy said, yeah, sure, just use the boat, no problem. And this, it's a pretty big boat. <laughs> it was seven meters long. It was like a seaworthy boat. And I started um, actually racing this boat as well. But fairly quickly found out I couldn't really race this boat on my own. It was simply too much to handle. Um, so then I thought, well, I could actually sleep on this boat. I could go somewhere with it. So I started going away for weekends, like just around where we lived and sleeping on this boat. I always took my dog with me. You've seen him in several pictures, but he was like my sailing buddy. Uh, <laughs> um, although, yeah, he didn't really like sailing, but he liked being with me. So <laughs> it kind of worked out. Then by the time I was 11, um, I had gotten the idea that I wanted to go with this boat on holiday on my own, like in the summer vacations, and I wanted to sail around Holland. I'd done that several times with my dad, um, and now I just wanted to do it on my own. Obviously, in the beginning, my dad said, no way, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and it took a lot of convincing. I, I think I like begged him every day, please, 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 let me go, let me go. Um, and eventually he said, okay, fine, you can do it, but we need to do a lot of uh, preparation for it. You know, you need to get your boat ready, you need to learn to navigate and cook and live on your own, and you definitely are taking the dog with you. And you don't put the dog on a leash. You take him with you everywhere you go, <laughs> um, because this, this dog was very guarding of me. Like, anybody could take the boat, but if they touched me, he would be really angry. <laughs> So that was like one of the things that my dad said, you're taking the dog with you. And then he allow actually allowed me to go on holiday on my own. So I sailed this boat through Holland. 
um, when I was 11, like for seven weeks, I just traveled around. Then when I was 12 years old, I did the same thing again. I just went around the whole of Holland for seven weeks on my own. Um, so then by the time I was 13, I kind of thought, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> because I've kind of seen everything in Holland and I want to go somewhere else. So I decided it was a really good idea to sail to England. That's about 100 nautical miles from Holland, takes about 24 hours to sail there. And um, this boat was definitely seaworthy enough to do it. So um, uh, I, I didn't actually think that my parents were going to allow me that. Um, I didn't really think anybody would think it was a good idea. I was smart enough for that. So I thought, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And I got my boat ready. Um, <laughs> and I left off in like a s short school holiday in Silja, England, without anybody knowing. I thought it was a great idea. It wasn't such a great idea. <laughs> But anyway, I was on my way, and I had this like horrible weather, which was foggy, crappy. Um, of course, I had no radar on this boat. I just had like paper charts, a GPS, and um, well, somehow I did make it to England, uh, fine actually, without much accidents. Although I was really nervous, um, so I was proud of myself. Of course, I got there. I was happy. I was there for a few days, and then the police turned up. Uh, <laughs> asked me what I was doing there. So um, I explained to police what I was doing there and that I had sailed and that I would sail back and it was all fine. They didn't really like my explanation much. So they uh, they actually took me to the police station in England. And, I, you know, at that stage, I didn't actually speak much English. So it was really funny. Um, and I was just sitting there at the police station and they called up my parents and they were, of course, very happy to hear that <laughs> I was safe. But uh, they wouldn't let me go until my dad actually came to England and picked me up from the police station. He wasn't happy. So, uh, yeah, it didn't turn out that well to not <laughs> tell anybody about my story. But, um, yeah, we were there in England together for a few more days. And then my dad said, well, you know, you sailed this boat here. It actually has to go back to Holland as well. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, sure, of course, I'm going to sail it back. He said, all right, you sail it back. I take the ferry. So he took the ferry, I sailed it back to Holland, and it was really on this trip, I had a much better trip on the way back, I do have to say that, it wasn't as crappy as this. But I was sitting there in the boat thinking, okay, so what am I gonna do now? Because obviously I hadn't learned my lesson, and I wanted to do <laughs> something else. And I thought I could sail up and down to England like a hundred times, or I could put all this distance behind each other, and I'll already be in Southern Europe. And that sounded much more appealing to me because I never really did like the cold and I wanted to go somewhere warmer. And then I thought, well, why would I finish until I'm done school? Because I could just take my schooling with me on the boat and I could sail around the world at the same time. And then when I'm done schooling, I've like fulfilled this dream and I can actually go and, and do something. So I thought this is a great idea. I've got a boat that can do it. I've got some money saved. I can navigate, I can do my schooling on the boat. What's the problem? Well, it turned out there were a lot of problems. <laughs> First of all, I had to convince my parents. Well, they were very easily, con not that easily, but yeah, I could convince them eventually. Um, I think the main reason was that they knew I was going to do it anyway, with, uh, with or without their blessing. <laughs> And um, they thought it was a much better idea if I did it prepared and stayed in contact with them. So they said yes. But then I actually had to sort out my schooling and uh, somehow it got into the media. Um, and then the whole thing exploded. And when I say exploded, like it exploded. From the one to the next day, I was like national news in Holland and everybody had an opinion about me. And it didn't take much longer for it to actually get internationally. And this was only because I had said I wanted to sail around the world. I hadn't actually done much yet. Um, <laughs> but very soon, it actually went to court. Um, the childcare in Holland had started a court case against my parents, saying that they were bad parents for even thinking of allowing me to do something like this. So we were sitting in court, and the child care actually wanted me to go to, like, a, uh, take me away from my parents, put me in a, some house, lock me up until I'm 18 years old. That's what I wanted. So very quickly, it actually turned into a nightmare. And I had no choice anymore whether to keep fighting or not, because the only other choice was that I would be locked away from my parents, which 
I loved a lot and I had a lot of respect for and I had no even comprehension or idea of how anybody could say that they were bad parents or how anybody could say some of the things that were written in the newspapers. I've made, I've just grabbed a few of the things that people said about me in this time and put it into a short video. Th these are things that really were in newspapers and blogs and people have said to me. It was so insane, like, I didn't know anything about this, obviously. I had just been on a boat my whole life, I had sailed my whole life, um, but I had no idea about all this paperwork, about lawyers, about court cases, about media, how to deal with media. And yet I had to, because I had a dream, because I wanted to do something with my life. And all these people said, no, you're absolutely crazy, you can't do this. Um, but I felt so strongly that this is what I wanted to do, that I needed to do this somehow. Um, and I had to keep on fighting. So I did, and eventually it actually took a year of fighting through court battles. I think we went through like eight court battles. And of course I am very blessed that my parents and my family stood by my side. Um, I think I, I could have never done it without them. There is always people you need around you that, that support you. But um, this battle that I had to fight was so much harder than any battle I actually had on my trip, than any storm I had seen, because I had no idea how to deal with it. So eventually, they actually said my boat was too small. I needed to get a bigger boat. Um, we had to fix that one up again. So everything I, I knew about maintenance and fixing a boat, I actually had learned from my dad. So this is the boat that actually sailed around the world, and she is uh, 38 foot, so that's about 12 meters. And um, yeah, it's kind of just like a camper van. You have got everything in it you need. You've got a little bed in the kitchen. Um, of course, I've got my navigation station where I have my charts and my GPS and all that. There's a toilet. Um, but it was basic in the sense that I didn't have a shower or um, a fridge or stuff like that. It was it was it was basic, but it was good to live in. So in August 2010, I was finally actually like allowed to leave on my trip. I was 14 years old at this stage, and uh, I left from Gibraltar. Well, I sailed with my dad to Gibraltar from Holland, and from Gibraltar I left on my own. So I sailed to the Canary Islands, to Cape Verde, and across the Atlantic Ocean, which of course was my first bigger crossing. And even though I had sailed a lot on my own, I had not done anything like that. So it was, it was super <laughs> exciting, and I had a lot to learn. Um, also about sailing in the tropics. I had always just sailed kind of in the northern parts where there is lots of storms and bad weather, but there aren't any squalls. And squalls are kind of like, sudden storms that come up on you and they have lots of wind or rain or things in it and quite often you can't actually see them coming uh, which can be kind of creepy and especially if you're like inside doing something um, it can come by surprise so <laughs> I had a lot of learning to do I was trying to do all of these things on the boat that you normally do as well like cooking and uh, going to the toilet and sleeping and uh, you kind of have to imagine that you're doing all of this while you're in a roller coaster. <laughs> so every you're just moving wildly to one side to the other side. You can't ever leave anything standing on its own because it will fly away like it actually did in this case. I was flying through the whole boat with my ravioli. Um, I think I just like ended up not eating that day because <laughs> it was just too difficult. Um, it was a big learning process like I knew how to sail and how to deal with boats but all the stuff around it was um yeah it just come as it comes as it goes but one of the big reasons I wanted to sail around the world was I wanted to see the world so I wanted to you know challenge myself but I also wanted to get to know other people and other cultures other countries and this was a really important part of my trip and actually in the end I think it was really also what I learned the most from and the most impressed me the most. Because I went to so many countries and so many islands and I met so many people 
that are so different from our, uh, our culture here that the first time I saw this little hut, it was somewhere in the Caribbean, I thought, there can't really be people living in that, right? But there were permanently living people in it, uh, people living in it. Um, there w it was like a family with three kids, and um, they invited me over to eat something, and I, I remember asking them, don't you want to live like in the city, or don't you want to have a bigger house or some more stuff? Because it was very basic inside, you know, there was like a little bed and some cooking stuff, but not much. And they kind of looked at me like, why? <laughs> we've got everything we need. We've got a roof above our heads. We've got food from the land. We've got water from the waterfall. And we've got our family with us. Like, there is nothing else we need. We are happy. And to be honest, a lot of these people that I saw living like this were truly happy. They were so much happier and so much uh, more hospitable than most of the people I meet in a city. And of course, I get this question a lot. Weren't you lonely? Well, quite honestly, I feel more lonely in a big city where I know and I feel that nobody really cares about me. If I like, like, drop dead on the street, people will probably just step over me and keep going on their business. And out on the ocean, it's just you, but it's so powerful and it's nature. And on these islands, you know, there weren't a lot of people, but the people were... They were people, they were being nice to each other. And that was, um, that was a beautiful experience for me, a beautiful thing to realize that happiness doesn't come from materialistic things, that it doesn't come from having a lot of stuff. It simply comes from realizing what you have and being happy with what you've got at the moment. And that's something that these people and the ocean actually taught me as well. Um, as I said before, you know, I, the boat was basic. I didn't have a shower, I didn't have a fridge. And in the beginning, I hated it. Like, it was so difficult to deal with. But eventually, I started realizing that what I had was super special. That these moments out there when you're, you're standing on the bow and you're watching these dolphins, those are things that you can't really buy. Those are experiences that will stay with you forever. And they were very special for me. And I have to admit that even still today, you know, it's like 10 years ago that I did this trip, I am so happy to be standing under a warm shower or to be lying in a bed that's like not salty and not trying to throw you out all the time. I'm still really grateful for these things and that's, um, that's thanks to living <laughs> on the sea for so long, I think. So besides dolphins, I obviously saw a lot of other sea creatures as well. Um, mostly flying fish, though, like a lot of flying fish, and generally in this form, uh, which is kind of <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> they just land up on the deck, and then if you wait a little bit too long, they kind of get sticky to it, and you have to stretch them off. Um, and I actually spent hours trying to get a good picture of a flying fish in action. Um, it never happens, really, because this picture that you just saw, I picked one of the flying fish, and uh, I threw it <laughs> and made a picture. And it worked out so well. He looks so happy, flying. I'm even pointing at him. Um, I think it's the best shot I ever got of a flying fish flying, although it's not alive, technically. But, you know, it looks like it. I have to say, though, that even though I did see the dolphins and the flying fish and whales and sharks, um, my parents said that on their trip, they saw dolphins almost every day. And I've been reading their old diaries, like they saw a lot of sea life everywhere they went. Um, so it was a big shock actually for me to realize how much they have diminished over the last couple of years. I sometimes went weeks without seeing any sea life. I saw plastic floating by. I came to beautiful paradise islands where there's like white beaches and palm trees yet the white beaches were covered in plastic. It's something I get asked a lot, and um, the you do know the answer is yes, it's real. I've seen it, it's out there. I haven't been to the garbage patch because it wasn't on my route, um, but I've seen the effects on it, and I've seen the islands covered by it and the problems caused by it, um, which is quite a big shock to realize, really, and I hope together that we can do something about it. 
So I went through the Panama Canal actually, and then I stopped in the Galapagos Islands briefly and uh, sailed to the Marquesas Islands. And this was a beautiful trip. It took me about 17 days at sea. Um, and um, the weather was great, but then suddenly one day, about halfway through the trip, uh, a big wave came and just kind of like hit the boat um, and I fell into the boat. And somewhere along the way, I hit my foot and I had a quite a deep hole in my heel of my foot. And it was bleeding a lot. <laughs> and, uh, well, I kind of bandaged it all up again, but um, obviously I couldn't walk very well on the boat. Um, Oh, on the boat it was alright, it's just 12 meters, so you know you don't have to walk that far. Although it's difficult to hop on one leg when the boat is moving so much. But the big problem was that it was just salty air, it was wet all the time, and the wound just didn't want to heal. In fact, it just kind of got bigger and bigger because it was just like, yeah, wet all the time. And it just it got really gross. <laughs> but then on the boat, there's not really any... Uh, bacteria or viruses or things that can go in it. Of course, I was going to one of these beautiful tropical islands with lots of <laughs> creepy stuff. And I remembered my parents telling me about like worms that would lay eggs in wounds or like that would just crawl in there. And I was, I was like honestly really scared to even go on land. I was looking there at my wound going, okay, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> But I needed to buy some food, I needed to you know, get diesel, I needed to get on land and, and repair some stuff on my boat. So eventually, after a few days, I did venture on land and I was kind of limping up this hill to get through the village. And then this, um, this guy with his family stopped by in a truck. They didn't speak any language that I speak, so it was an interesting conversation. <laughs> but it kind of ended up with, well, there's something with your food, what happened, can you come with me? Um, so I went with this family, and the woman straight away went into the garden, and she kind of got together some plants and herbs and stuff, and she put it all on my foot and bandaged it up. And uh, then they brought me back to my boat, and I thought, wow, that's really nice. Like That was very, very nice of them to do that. But then the following day, they stood there again, and they said, come on, we need to take care of your foot. And they did so for about a week. They actually got me every day and took care of my foot, and I was really grateful because I honestly believed I was like gonna lose my foot or something there. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to say thank you or give them something to, to tell them how grateful I was. So I had gifts or money. And every time I tried to give it to them, they just refused it. They were like, they even seemed some sort of angry about it that I was trying to give them something for it. And I never really understood it because I wasn't able to communicate well with them either. Until uh, just a few years back, I was on these islands again, and I met a guy who actually spoke good English. And I, I asked him this, because I, didn't, I still didn't really get it. And he said, you know, that's the way their community works. And s he said something then that I found really beautiful, which is the gift of giving is gone when you get something back. These people believed, and I think they are very right, that by helping somebody, um, you know, they didn't want me to give it back to them because then, then the magic was gone. They wanted me to forward it. So if I saw somebody who needed help, then I would help them, and that person would give it further. So it wasn't, it wasn't between two people. It would actually make a big circle and eventually come back to them if they needed help. And I found that very beautiful and something that actually over the years I've seen on quite a few of these islands in the Pacific. So I went through the Pacific Ocean actually rather quickly because my original route went through the Red Sea, um, but I couldn't do that anymore because of piracy, but I also kind of changed my mind. And I wanted to go around South Africa. I was very late in the season, so I needed to hurry up <laughs> a bit. But I love these islands so much, and I was like visiting the people, and every time something broke on the boat or something kind of didn't go so well, I just repaired it with duct tape and rope, and I didn't really care about it much. Until I was sailing from Vanuatu to Australia, which is the last little stripe on the line here, and then everything on the boat just like started falling, falling apart. Um, I even had my steering wheel fall off. <laughs> So <laughs> it was just like lying there. You kind of really need a steering wheel on the boat. That was an important part. So <laughs> I, I 
kind of just put it back up there and try to fix it. But also all of my sails ripped. Um, obviously, if it's like a little rip, like on the left, I would just stitch it up myself. But on this journey, it was actually, well it's, it's a dark picture because obviously when your sails rip to pieces, it happens in the middle of the night. <laughs> and it was just a huge gaping gap um, in the Genoa. And then the next day, actually, my main sail tore apart as well. So it took me quite a while to get to Australia. And when I was there, I had a lot of fixing to do on my boat. Um, and it was really a lesson for me because I was like working on the boat for about a month, trying to fix everything again. That when something isn't quite right, and I think this doesn't only apply to the boat, but to life in general, if something is a little bit broken or it just isn't quite right, it, the problem is only gonna get bigger. So if you don't fix it right away, it's just gonna expand and at some stage it's like really gonna go very bad. Um, as I experienced here, because on that trip, like literally everything fell apart, and I had so much work to fix it all again. Whereas I could have probably just spent a couple of days on each island fixing it as well. Another big decision I made on my journey was to not have any financial sponsors. So I had sponsors for like the solar panels and the sails and um, some things I needed on the boat but nothing financial. And this was a decision I made quite early on, actually. It wasn't because I couldn't have them. <laughs> they were there, but um, I really felt like, you know, it was my dream and I wanted to fight for it. I wanted to stay at mine and I wanted to do it my way. Um, I was very firm in that. And I felt like if I was gonna get sponsors, they would turn my dream into their business and tell me what to do. I didn't want that. You know, it's their right. It's the way sponsorship works. Um, but at this stage of my life, I didn't want that. It obviously had a lot of consequences. It meant that I actually had to work along the way. So I had to like find a job as crewing on other boats or uh, fixing things or doing presentations every now and then. Um, and eating cheap food like pasta, <laughs> um, anchoring out, uh, fixing things myself. And this uh, picture actually applies to it quite well because in uh, Darwin in Australia, I needed to get my boat out of the water. And that's very expensive. So um, <laughs> I was sitting there, okay, I've already like wasted all of this money in repairing my boat and now I also need to get it out of the water. But there is also a huge tide difference, like seven meters between high and low tide. And I saw these posts on the uh, beach and I asked the local people whether they were still used. And they kind of just looked at me and said, well, what would they be for? <laughs> and I was like, okay, so they're not used much. Um, because I, I do actually think that this is what they're originally for. Maybe not, maybe there was something else. I will never know. Um, but on high tide, I went up to these piles and I tied up the boat and just waited until the tide went down until I could you know, do a few things on the underside of the boat. And then the tide went up again and down again uh, because yeah, you don't have a lot of time to work on it before it's up again, and I had quite a lot of work to do. But it did save me a lot of money, so that was good. And then obviously the boat was very basic as well, so I had like no internet on the boat, no like big communications. Um, I had a VHF radio, which enabled me to talk to like other sailors if they were close by. And uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Just my, my charts and my GPS, which was actually quite nice. Um, Obviously, yeah, if things broke on the boat, I had to fix it. And then the everyday life stuff as well. So doing the washing, cleaning up, cooking. And I hate cooking. Like, I honestly, I think that part was the hardest part for me because I, I loved working on the boat and doing stuff with the boat. But then also having to cook every day while you're in a roller coaster was quite horrible. So it, it generally just ended up being pasta and pancakes <laughs> all the time, which... You can live on for about two months until you start feeling really exhausted and sick. <laughs> you really need to have some fresh food. So, wow. From uh, Australia, I sailed in a straight piece to uh, South Africa. That took me about 48 days. It's like 6,000 miles. And it started out fantastic, which is like two weeks of absolutely no wind, which might seem quite nice 
but isn't actually because out in the ocean if there's no wind there is always still a big swell um, so the boat is still rolling and the sails are flapping and it's kind of just driving you crazy because there's nothing you can do and it's hot and humans and stuff is breaking and you're not going anywhere and I, I, I like I hated it it was horrible um, just being powerless to do anything so when the storm came through the first storm I was actually really happy. Like I was just standing there saying, yes, <laughs> finally some wind. We were going completely the wrong way and everything was salty and wet, but I was very happy. The Indian Ocean was a tough ocean. I had uh, actually a lot of storms and then no wind again and then a storm again and then this weird bird came by that just like hated me. Uh, <laughs> you can see how grumpy he looks. He stayed on the boat for like a week and he didn't want to drink and eat and I talked to him in like Dutch and English and German and he didn't answer. Um, yeah, it was, it was weird. I think he was just really exhausted. Um, <laughs> it was kind of nice to have company though. Although he didn't leave me a very nice present. He just like pooped on my solar panels. <laughs> and it took me like two days to find out why my batteries weren't charging. <laughs> Stupid bird. I didn't get a good relationship with birds on my trips because they quite often did that actually. I think they like the warmth of the solar panels. So besides the Indian Ocean being quite a rough ocean, like sailing-wise and weather-wise, it was mentally one of the nicest oceans and one of the nicest times I had sailing. Because after two weeks, the time just like disappeared and I didn't care anymore what day it was or what week or what month. I was just there. And for the first time, I realized that being together with nature and being there on my own, like how special it was and how beautiful nature is. I think up until then I had always kind of fought it. So when the wind was wrong or there were just waves smashing in my face, I was being angry at it. And I said, you know, why can't it just the weather just be good? Um, it pretty much never is. <laughs> and on this trip, it was the weather was so shitty that, you know, after two weeks of being angry at the weather, I kind of had to give it up because it was simply too tiring. And then I, because I let it go, I started to realize how beautiful it really is and how amazing it is that you can go with such a tiny little thing across an ocean with waves and wind that is so powerful. You know, you stand there and you feel so incredibly small. And you realize that actually humans are nothing compared to the powers of nature. And I felt really blessed. At that moment, I was like, this is amazing that I can be there on my own. My boat's called Guppy. Those are these tiny little fish. Well, that's really what you feel like when you're out in the ocean. And I don't think it matters how big your boat is. So from South Africa, I sailed in one straight line back to the Caribbean. And that was actually a very nice trip weather-wise. But it was kind of scary because it was the end of my trip. You know, that's where the lines cross. So that's, yeah, kind of where the official beginning and ending of the trip was or something like that. At least that is to the world. Because for me, it didn't feel like that. To me, it felt like that once I had arrived in South Africa, I had already achieved everything that I wanted. I had seen cultures. I'd seen the people. I had gotten to know myself. I'd been in storms and in calms. I had achieved what I wanted. So when I got to St. Martin and everybody <laughs> was cheering and being really happy, I kind of just stood there and thought, okay, cool, now what am I gonna do? <laughs> and uh, I decided I didn't want to go back to Holland. I uh, continued on sailing to New Zealand, which is you know, another half time around the world. Um, <laughs> on this trip, I took a little cat with me that I called Kiwi, because we were New Zealand bound. Um, I also had an uh, uninvited guest Mr. Sea Lion. That was kind of <laughs> weird. He just blobbed onto the boat one day <laughs> and stayed there a whole night. I didn't chew him off. They've got rather sharp, sharp teeth. Uh, so this is my whole trip around the world, starting off in Europe, going around to the Caribbean, and then another half time around to New Zealand. And when I was there, I, uh, I started working with a marine electrician. So, uh, you know, because I I wanted to know more about the electrics and the electric parts and things on boats. But I also got my captain's license because, well, you actually need to be 18 for that. Uh, 
but that enabled me to uh, do deliveries and actually take it on professionally as a job, which is quite cool and I have been doing over the past years. So that also brought me back into the islands and into the Pacific and I've been volunteering and working for some schools in New Zealand. Um, and I've been working quite a bit with like 14, 15 year olds, mostly girls because I was working in a girls high school. And so often I looked at them and I thought, man, I wish I could just like put you on a boat and send you through a storm because that would just stop you whining about how bad everything is and how hard it is. And, and then eventually I thought, well, why don't I just do that? Why don't I just get a big boat and gather up students and send them through a storm basically? So I came up and I set up a foundation with the idea of building a big boat, which you can see up there. Well, it's not that big actually, it's 24 meters. Um, it's just enough to have 12 students. It's like twice the size of Guppy. And um, I basically want to replicate my trip. And the idea is definitely that the students that come on board, they sail the boats. They have to cook, they have to clean, they have to send the boat through a storm, they have to navigate, they have to deal with each other, and they will learn a lot of stuff. Now, I don't want to teach them sailing, because most of the things you can learn are really not about sailing, but they are life skills that I think are really missing in schools today. Um, schools are very theoretical, and it's great. You know, I see a lot of <laughs> kids coming out, they're 16, 17, and they have a lot of knowledge, they know a lot of theory, and they have no idea how to put it into practice. They have no idea how to actually make it work in the world. So with my program, that's something I want to do. I want to put the theory and the practical side of life together and give them those building blocks that they do know how to communicate, how to work in a team, how to come up for themselves, how to have their own ideas and not just follow the rules and a path that a school has made up. So this is something that I have been working on for the past year and um, yeah, something that I, I will definitely, that you know, that's my next goal, my next dream and um, besides <laughs> working as a marine electrician and doing deliveries, this is um, my life goal. So if I can leave you with anything today, you know, there's a lot of people here that have dreams and want to do something and I'm sure you're already in a good way, but what I have learned most is that when you have a dream, it's going to be hard. Like, you're going to fall on your nose, stuff isn't going to work, and people are going to say you can't do it, and that's going to be really tough. But there is nothing as fulfilling and beautiful as actually reaching your goal, as actually fighting for it. It's worth it. Please keep going. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Very interesting. So many uh, different areas that we could go with your talk there. Um, tell us again, just remind us again, so what, when you're on that boat, what, you, you, what communication? You said you could talk to other sailors, to other boats. Did you have a direct link to anyone back home? So I had a uh, satellite telephone, like in emergencies, mm -hmm. I could actually contact somebody or contact my parents. Um, in the beginning, I didn't really have much, but then halfway through my trip, I got an SSB radio, which is like a long wave radio, and I could actually okay. send short messages home. Okay. Yeah. So you got SMS on the boat or kind something like that? Yeah, kind of like that. Okay. <laughs> and so did the, your, your family need, or whoever's at the other end, need an equivalent device to pick that up and listen to those yep. messages? Yep. Interesting. And is a satellite phone really expensive or something to yeah, call? Yeah, yeah, it's like I super expensive. So uh, I wasn't really allowed to use it and <laughs> unless it was really necessary. Were there some times when you, well, I mean, did you look at that satellite phone and go, oh, I could just uh, make a call? Or? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. But then I thought, no, I, I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to have to do this myself. Did you have to call a few um, times? I called once, which in the end was actually kind of stupid because it was in the Torres Strait. It was like, like a difficult stretch of water with lots of reefs and ships and I was really nervous and then the sail ripped in half and uh, there was just a kind of a lot of wind and ships and I, I didn't, like for a moment I was just not sure what to do and I called my dad and he picked up and he said, well, have you filmed it yet? <laughs> and then he just hung up and I was like, what? <laughs> I was. I think I was so shell shocked that I just grabbed the camera and started filming. 
um, and started explaining to the camera what had happened. Yeah. And, and through explaining it to the camera, I kind of went like, okay, I, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I can, I can deal with it. Uh. It's going to be okay. <laughs> That's an interesting tool in being able to detach from a situation if you're spending so many days and weeks alone in your own head. And you said, you know, you, you were up and down in those journeys. That, that was, I guess, a method of detachment to get away from yourself. I'm not just with my own head. I'm talking to a camera. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I did that a lot. I, I talked a lot of bullshit to the camera. <laughs> my, my parents kind of, they watched back the videos and kind of went, right, is, is, like, is something going to happen or you just keep talking? Yep. Is there a way you could talk briefly? We only have a little bit of time, but talk, I, I'm interested in that balance between uh, you, you're quite young when you start, you still have commitments to a formal education. And how, first of all, how did that go on the boat that you're trying to keep up your studies? But then as you reflect now later, because you said that, well, with your, your school, uh, sorry, with your foundation, you want to teach uh, these young ladies more than what they can learn at school, and I would agree. But how do you, you see that balance between a formal education and this sort of school of hard knocks and, and life and, and nature that you experience? Like, what's that balance that we should be finding? Well, I think you, sh you do need both. Like, the theor theory is important. Um, but it, it, it's like if you only have the theory, you only have one side of the key, and you kind of need both sides. So I wouldn't say, you know, just go sailing and don't do anything else, um, but, but definitely try to combine the both. So you should travel or in somehow make the theory or what you're wanting to learn in, in practical and actually start doing it. Hmm. Okay, very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please, one more round of applause for Lara Decker. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.